You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back for another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I'm Paul Garner. And I'm Todd Wood. Uh, Don't forget to like and share our episodes, um, tell your friends about us, um, all of that good stuff. Um, And if you like what we're doing with the podcast, um, do consider making a donation to support us. Um, You can go to letstalkcreation.org. And you can find out all the information about how to do that there. Uh, now, I've, I've been looking forward to this episode, Todd. Um, we're we're going to do something slightly different today. We're, we're, we're going to be thinking about the extent of Noah's flood, um, whether the flood was local or global. And um, we decided to do this sort of in response to um, a video that was posted recently by um, a Christian apologist who many people will, will know. Uh, called Gavin Ortland um, on his YouTube channel. Now, uh, just to introduce Gavin, uh, until recently, Gavin was senior pastor of First Baptist Church in Ojai, California, um, but he now runs his own uh, apologetics ministry called Truth Unites, uh, on which he sort of devotes a lot of time to um, interacting with uh, Catholic apologists and others, as well as promoting sort of his own ideas about theological triage. Uh, you know, how do we decide um, what theological hills are worth dying on and which, which are not? Um, and um, some of our viewers may be aware that recently um, Gavin has also been posting some videos about the creation evolution issue, um, particularly um, concerning the age of the earth. And one of his recent videos was a biblical defense of the local flood position. Uh, And then there was a a kind of follow-up video as well, where he sort of responded to to some of his sort of online critics. And we've not really done this before, but we thought it was worth sort of interacting with with some of this a bit. Now, you know, we aren't, we're we're not a debate channel. That's not really what we're kind of about. Um, And so this isn't going to be a direct response, if you like, to Gavin Ortland per se but rather um, an examination of what we th- what you might think of as the conundrum of the flood. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I'll explain what we sort of mean by that uh, as we go along. And then we'll sort of follow that with an explanation of how both the local flood and the global flood explanations seek to resolve this conundrum. And then, uh, and so what we'll do basically is we'll we'll try to give as positive a case for the local flood position as as we can. Um, that case is a little bit different to the case that Gavin makes, but we're going to try and sort of make a a, a, you know, a, a, posi- a an argument for the local flood position, but then also sort of explain what we think some of the problems with that position are. And we're going to address in particular some of the specific points that Gavin talks about in his videos sort of towards the end. So that's kind of where we're going with this. So it's sort of, um, yeah, slightly different to, to what we, yeah. we, we're we used to doing. And I should say here, uh, uh, we got a lot of requests when that video went up about the local flood, when Gavin's video went yeah. up about the local flood. And I have um, steadfastly resisted doing response videos since we started i i'm i'm a guy who thinks you know this this back and forth sniping on youtube is just tiresome and annoying and i don't care you're trying to make me care about your little squabbles and i don't care and um it's soul draining and so i've 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 not really wanted to do this even this video i didn't want to do but honestly, the more I, I thought about it, the more I, I thought. I had to oh. twist your arm, right? So it's I not just that, but the <laughs> local flood question is really fascinating to me. Yeah, <laughs> and I realized, yeah. you know, if 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 let's talk creation is all about uh, learn, grow, and worship, we're going to learn really cool things if we actually stop and and talk about the local flood. So, like you say, this this is an episode that is. That is, let's call it inspired by Gavin Ortland, and not yeah. necessarily just a direct rebuttal. Although we will do some response stuff at the end, but yeah, yeah. So the the challenge I see here going into this, um, and this is this is kind of <clears throat> this has kind of frustrated me for years, and it's not just Gavin. And it, frankly, I don't really even know 
I don't really follow Gavin's ministry, so I don't really know much about his work. But, but I see a lot of people that I engage with are willing to sort of address the questions of the text that the text raises about science in, in very simple ways that do not survive deep examination. Let's put it that way. Um, and, and I, and I understand that, um, a lot of these positions that people hold and advocate are positions that they're, that they're, uh, they are personal. They're extremely personal. They are addressing a particular question or anxiety that that person has, and it does whatever it is that they've come up with addresses those questions for their own sake, even though it may not be generally applicable. Let's put it that way. Um, and I think this one, this question of the local flood is one of those questions where I feel like the harder I look into this, the more the local flood idea just doesn't really cohere. It doesn't hold together. Um, and it doesn't really work. But getting people to actually engage with questions of archaeology, questions of geology, questions of, of, of the text itself, all of those things, you get people who are experts in one of those areas, but they're just not really that interested in going deep. So I guess our episode here is going to be uh, unique in that way. And yeah, yeah. so conundrum of the flood. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, and think I, we... I want to say before you, before you say that, I want to say one more time, we are not targeting Gavin Ortland. If you're a Gavin yeah. Ortland fan, good for you. I hope God blesses you through his work. Um, yeah. And I mean that genuinely and sincerely and yeah. honestly. Uh, we're not here to pick on people. I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm just making some general observations about how these things have gone and and what it means for this particular issue. So, yeah. So, yeah. Paul, conundrum uh, of the yeah, flood, no, what do you got? <laughs> well, be yeah, before I come to that, I mean, I just want to reiterate what you said. Um, I, I have watched some of Gavin's videos and I, you know, I have, I, I, I like his demeanor. I think he's a cordial guy. You know, he, he, interacts well with people that he disagrees with um he's very likable um I, i've benefited from some of his videos so so none of this you know is kind of an attack on gavin ortland i want to make that absolutely clear um you know in, in, in fact you know i it would be great to have a kind of cordial discussion with with gavin about some of these questions because topics like this can get heated so quickly they could they can <laughs> As you say, you know, it can descend into the sort of the um, the darker corners of the internet, and you can see all of this kind of fighting and and stuff. And I think, like Gavin, we we have a concern for Christians to be able to talk about things like this that they disagree with, and to do and to do that in a reasonable, cordial way. Um, so that's that's kind of what we want to try and achieve with this. So the conundrum of the flood. Um, well, I, I suppose we should start with why do we think that the Bible um, describes a global flood? Because I think a very strong case can be made for this. There are, there are lots of things to say, and I'll try to be brief because we could easily spend a whole episode, you know, and we probably will in our Creationism 101 mm -hmm. series, mm -hmm. you know, on, mm -hmm. on this. Um, so, so, so why do we think that the Bible sort of, at least at, at face value, describes a, a worldwide flood? Well, firstly, there's the stated purpose of the flood. Uh, for example, in Genesis 6, verse 7, uh, we read, I will blot out man whom I, I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. And we, we see something similar in Genesis 7, verse 4, where we, we read that every living thing that I've made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And it seems, at least on the, on the face of it, that that purpose for the flood could only be achieved if um, the flood was universal. And I want you to note particularly that that blotting out includes not only the people, but also the animals. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's one thing. Uh, and then, of course, there are texts like Genesis 6, verse 13, where God says, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. 
And of course, to understand what God means by all flesh, we need to look in context. And in Genesis 7, verse 21, all flesh is defined for us because we're told that all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and the people. So all flesh includes, again, the people and the animals. And it's all flesh that appears to be described as violent and, and corrupt before the flood. And then we've got this issue of the, the size and the provision of, of the ark. You know, the ark is absolutely massive, as, as we know. We've already talked about that in a previous episode. And uh, again, you know, why would you need an ark for a local flood? On, on the face of it, it seems unnecessary, um, given that Noah and the animals could have escaped the flood simply by sort of relocating or moving to higher ground or to the next valley or, or whatever it is. Right. So. There's that. And then, of course, we've got the description of the flood itself, uh, the 40 days and nights of rain, um, a description of a massive flood, you know, unlike anything in our uh, experience, that the fact that all the high mountains under the whole heaven are covered. And it's hard to see how all the high mountains, even in one local region, uh, could be covered by a local flood, or even, even a large regional flood. Um, and then there's this, you know, as you read the text, as you read through Genesis 6 to 9, you're struck by the multiple use of universal terms. Uh, you know, it's, it's like the author is emphasizing this, that you can't miss the point. And of course, this is what Hebrew does, doesn't it? Hebrew writers use repetition to emphasize points. This is what they do. And uh, so, so the, the case here isn't that it rests on a single word or verse or one single expression, but the fact that we have this cumulative use of universal terms, all, every, only. And of course, this universality is stated in different ways. It's stated positively, everything died, but it's also stated negatively, only Noah and those on the ark were saved. So we have this sort of positive negative way of expressing the same truths. Um, it's also significant that the post-flood promises are couched in the same universal language uh, that the flood itself is, is described. Uh, we have God's promise, of course, never again to send a flood that will destroy all flesh or destroy the earth. And I think a legitimate question is, is um, if the flood was local, has that promise been violated? Mm -hmm. um, but then we've also got the post-flood covenant that God makes with Noah, the animals on the ark, and their descendants. And we apply that covenant uh, sort of universally. But of course, if there were people or animals that were not affected by the flood, um, then that obviously becomes um, problematic. Uh, and then if we turn to the New Testament, um, we have this portrayal of the flood, particularly in a passage like 2 Peter chapter 3, where the flood is sort of the counterpoint to the original creation and the new creation. We have the original creation being undone by the flood, um, the waters again covering the earth like they did in the beginning. You know, this is a reversal of creation. And then we have a new world that emerges uh, after the flood. And of course, this points forward to the new heavens and the new earth that is going to come when, when Jesus returns. And it's hard to see how the flood can be anything other than coextensive with the original creation and the new creation when you, you read a passage like that. And then just two more points very briefly. Um, we also have to reckon with the fact that the pre-modern interpretation uh, was that the flood was universal with respect to the globe. Now, there may have been the odd exception, but generally speaking, if you, if you look at, across the witness of church history, they are exceptions. Most people seem to accept that the flood was um, universal. And in both Old and New Testaments, it's also interesting that we have unique words used to describe the flood. Both in Hebrew, we have the word marbul. In uh, Greek, we have kataklusmos. And both of these words are used only of the flood, uh, arguably perhaps, but they, they seem to be used only of the flood, um, suggesting that these were unique events. So I think there's a very strong 
cumulative case, at least at face value, uh, to say that the flood was worldwide. Uh, yeah. So, Todd, take take us on. From yeah, that. yeah, I think I think that's I think that's right. I think <clears throat> once again, I'm impressed by this is not just taking the text literally or something like that. Yeah. This is, you know, we there's lots of ways ways to read through the text and say, yeah, this this really does that. And the thing that really clinches it for me or at least impresses me maybe more than others is that that notion of those repetitious um universal words um if i were say a pre-modern person who did not have a developed uh, concept or even a word for planet or globe and i wanted to communicate to you that the flood covered the planet or the globe uh that's how i'd do it right everything under and everything died everything everywhere under the face of heaven died everything that had the breath of life died the flood covered everything the flood covered the whole land it covered uh all the earth i would just keep repeating that until you got the sense of okay so he's not talking about a river overflowing its banks he means this flood covered everything um hmm. yeah so so that strikes me as quite important because that's exactly what you see in the text. And I encourage our readers, uh, go read uh, Genesis 7, um, because you will see those universals. It's just, they just, it's like hammer blows on an anvil. Wham, 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 wham. Just one after the other. Yeah. And it's not always the same one. He, they bury the whole thing, uh, the way that those words are used. Now, that does lead us up to the conundrum of the flood. And, um, the conundrum has been, you know, how exactly do you relate this notion of a global flood to the physical evidence that we see around us, right? Um, now, early speculations, and this is this is tricky because there's, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot going into this, but uh, there's early speculations that sort of the f fossils that we see, the things that we understand as fossils, were deposited by the flood. Um, that's not universal, but there are s speculations along that line. Um, and then, uh, as geology developed and began to recognize a geologic column, then people began to think that, okay, well, there was just a there's been a series of floods, essentially, a series of cataclysms, um, and that only the most recent one was the flood described in the Bible. That make it that makes that flood to be the sort of uppermost um, layers of of debris and rock. And a guy named Buckland, you might remember Mr. Buckland. Um, yes. Yeah. William Buckland. William Buckland. Yes. There you go. Uh, yeah, he associated the flood with this this pretty well known set of superficial uh, kind of debris deposits from Europe and North America. They called these actually diluvium, right? So mm -hmm. diluvium relating to diluvial, which is a word describing flood. Uh, so these were called diluvium, and he just assumed that this must be the remains of the global flood, but. Uh, here in uh, the United States, Agassiz came along, uh, Louis Agassiz, and began to study these um, this diluvium, and in particular made a very influential uh, expedition around Lake Superior. And he came to the conclusion that the diluvium was really the remnants of glaciers that had already that had melted away uh and not in fact the the debris from the flood so that sort of set up the problem right so you have the the initial idea that the flood made the fossils which was some speculation and then came the old age idea that came along with the geologic column that basically said the flood is the most recent thing and that the other, the lower layers are caused by s something else. And then you have uh, Buckland who says, ah, it must be this diluvium here on the surface, which sure looks like it's water transported catastrophic debris. And then you have Agassiz who says, nope, 
<laughs> it's not that. It's uh, that debris is comes from glaciers, and there there was a time at which um, glaciers covered Europe and North America. Hmm. Now, in the modern world, we pick up this story, uh, and we now have super impressive uh, digital maps of the globe, um, including. Uh, topographic information, which tells us how far above and below sea level things are. And we have very good um, measurements of how much water there is on the planet. And so we can actually go in digitally and figure out, all right, if we converted all the water on the planet from ice into liquid water, uh, what would that do to the planet? And what you find is it does not flood the planet that we're living on. Which I think should come as some surprise to all of us Bible believers. We would think that if you, if you doused uh, the world in completely liquid water, that it would, it would, everything would die and the whole face of the heaven would be covered and so forth. But apparently there's not enough water to do that. So, for example, in North America, you lose the eastern seaboard. Um, the coastline would go inland to around the middle of uh, Alabama, the middle of Georgia, so forth. So um, that would happen. In Europe, um, London and Cambridge go underwater. Sorry, Paul. Uh, <laughs> but apparently Manchester, Birmingham, and all of Wales uh, remain, the Lake District, they all remain above sea level. Um, continental Europe, you lose uh, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Uh, the Caspian Sea would connect to the Black Sea. Um, Africa is essentially the same. Africa doesn't really change much. South America, you have massive uh, uh, inlets of sea at the Amazon Basin and down in Paraguay. And then in Asia, you get a lot of eastern China underwater. And then um, in Australia, there's some, there's some really big lakes called Lake, around uh, Lake Torrens, which is in the south. I don't know that I've said that right. Sorry, Australians. Uh, but that joins up to a massive inlet of the sea as well. Um, but otherwise, the ground is still exposed. There's a huge amount of ground still exposed. And I'm going to make sure we link to that, uh, that particular National Geographic site there that shows you what happens when all the water goes into, uh, goes from being ice to water. And so you can check out if your town would be flooded in that scenario too. Um, so that's the conundrum, right? I mean, that, that's essentially the conundrum. Where did the evidence of the flood go? Um, and one way of handling this that is perhaps the easiest way of handling it is to say, all right, well, the science has shown that there was no global flood and that indeed there could be no global flood. And therefore, the story of the flood in Genesis is some sort of narrative theological device. Um, and we might say it's, you know, it's rooted in the ancient Near Eastern stories, similar stories of the flood in the ancient Near East and so forth. Um, and I think, yeah, there's still a lot of evangelical scholars out there who I think would be very uncomfortable with that, with that reaction. So, Okay, so there's the conundrum. Where did the evidence of the flood go? Why don't why isn't it obvious to us? Paul, yeah. How do we how do we young age creationists deal with this? What do we come up with that that answers this this yeah. challenge? Sure. So the the young age creationist um response to this is to say um we've underestimated the flood and its physical evidence. Um, the, the scriptural evidence that I kind of very briefly summarized at the beginning of this episode seems very compelling. Um, it does look as if the Bible really wants us to understand that the flood was worldwide, you know, and that it covered the whole planet. And so the, the young age creationist response to this is to say, well, the flood as we've imagined it in the past is, is simply too small. Um, what we really need to be um, looking for. Uh, is a flood that could reshape the whole surface of the planet. Um, it, it, it's got to be a, a, a giant tectonic event because, it, because it's got to um, completely sort of reformat the surface of the Earth. It's got to produce <laughs> yeah. mountains and, 
It's it's got to change the depths of the ocean basins. It's it's got to lay down you know huge deposits of sediment on the newly formed continents and so on. So what we say is you've got to zoom out and think much bigger uh, about the flood than we've thought before. Um, in fact, that the flood that I think we envisage as young age creationists is so awful, truly terrible that if God had not remembered Noah, as the biblical text tells us, then nothing would have survived, not even those on the ark. So that, that would be our response. Now, of course, there are drawbacks to, to that position, um, which you know we're familiar with, because what it means is that lots of geological evidence needs to be reinterpreted. And that's an enormous challenge. You know, this is a this is a huge yeah. endeavor that we're talking about here. This is not a small um, uh, sort of rethinking of, of the scientific evidence. And I think it's fair to say we haven't been um, shy about pointing out that, that we need to do this. Um, we need to rethink everything. Where, where are the flood sediments? You know, where do we see them in, in the rock record? Um, which rocks might be deposited before the flood or during the flood or after the flood? Um, what does the fossil record mean? Uh, how do we interpret it um, in this context of the flood? Um, what about all the radiometric dates? You know, we've got a series going on radiometric dating. What do those dates mean if if they're not telling us about a, a very old Earth? Um, what about those crustal rearrangements and the production of mountains and changing you know the shape and depth of ocean basins how do we do that how how did these rapid sort of crustal rearrangements happen um where did all the heat go i mean this is a big question um if you compress all of this geological activity into a short period of time you generate lots of heat what happened to that heat so we're not um unaware that there are enormous challenges and difficulties to this position but i think we're our response would be to say the Bible is clear, the text is clear, and what it means is we've got to think very differently about the scientific evidence. So that's how we would respond. What yeah. about the local flood response? How how would you kind of make an argument for that, given the conundrum that we've sort of set out yeah. at the beginning of this episode? Yeah, so I want to I want to first of all agree with you. You're absolutely right. I've I've always you know when i've taught origins courses to churches or whatever or spoken on this issue i've always said plate tectonics is the most important discovery uh, that we ever made because now we have a mechanism whereby you can lower the mountains raise the seabed and actually create a global flood because we don't have mm -hmm. enough water to do that um otherwise so yeah, yeah really important and and that means we have vastly underestimated the scale of the flood it's just huge it's huge beyond almost beyond comprehending we have no yeah. analogy for it in the in the world so all right so the other option of course to the conundrum of the flood is that we are going to localize it we're going to say for example perhaps genesis is not describing um the flood as a truly global thing, but simply a, it destroyed the world of Noah, which encases a large amount of the land, okay? So maybe even a shockingly, unprecedentedly large amount of land, um, but it was not across the planet. But it was enough, and this is the other important part, it was enough to kill all the people. So it's universal to human beings, but it's not universal to the entire planet. Now, before I get into this, there's a couple things I want to say. One is this is this is not I have not borrowed anybody else's version of the local flood model. This is Todd Wood's interpretation. This is Todd Wood's best estimate of what the, the local flood model ought to be. Um, and it is not my position. Before my detractors yeah. get all excited that I'm about to tip my hand, no, I don't believe what I'm about to say. <laughs> I'm playing, you know, I'm playing the other side, trying to give them the best that I can come up with. So, all right. So, could you understand this uh, in uh, a local fashion? And, and there's, 
uh, there are some reasons why you might do this. So not just because of the conundrum of the flood, but for example, the, the, the universal words that we see in this text are used hyperbolically in other, in other passages, uh, meaning that they are used in, in a way that means exag- it, it's kind of exaggerated. So let's say, Paul, that I went to a, uh, a church picnic and I told you everybody was there. Um, you would understand that you would not understand that to mean literally, you know, King Charles was there and, um, Harrison Ford was there. And no, you would understand that when I say everyone was there, I'm probably talking about my church. And you might even say, I, I don't necessarily mean everyone on the actual membership role of my church, because I don't carry that around with me and check off as I notice. Maybe I just mean there's a lot of people there that I recognize and it was really crowded at my church picnic, right? So yeah. it is natural in the way we talk to use these hyperbolic terms to mean this is really big or this is really amazing and not to mean a, this woodenly literal notion that these things must be universal. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we have passages in the Bible where we think this is probably hyperbolic. Um, there, we oftentimes see reference to all the world, uh, doing something in the Bible. All the world comes to Egypt to buy grain in the time of, of, of Joseph. Uh, all the world comes to festivals in Jerusalem, for example. And we know it does not mean, you know, people from, (laughs) people from New Zealand, the Maori in New Zealand came over to the, no. We understand what it means. It means just a lot of people from a lot of places. Okay, so we got to be careful reading these universals. We also notice, as we look into the archaeology of Mesopotamia, uh, and this comes up quite a lot, that there are evidences of really large flooding events that deposit huge, huge chunks of clay and, 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 and sand and so forth. Um, so there are these archeological candidates for what the flood might be. It's not that we're just saying, ah, oh, maybe it's, maybe it's a local, maybe it's a local thing. No, we, there are layers that might well be these sorts of things. Uh, and of course there are other people who have, have proposed other ideas about where the flood might've taken place. The original flood that inspired the biblical story. Um, and we would also mention those other ancient Near Eastern uh, texts. Now, we've we mentioned this already. So there are other stories, for example, the, the Utnapishtim story. That's a great word. I love saying that, Utnapishtim. <laughs> um, there, there are flood stories in the ancient Near East that are not the Israelite version. And so maybe everybody there is remembering a time when there was this massive flood that destroyed a lot of stuff. And so they all have their version of the story. And, you know, the biblical version is sort of the, the consecrated theological version and everybody else is sort of this corrupted pagan myth. Um, and we would emphasize here the setting here in Mesopotamia because You know, Genesis describes Eden by describing the Tigris and Euphrates rivers um, as part of the geographic setting of of Eden. So if you were to want to destroy the pre-flood people, well, it makes sense that they would be around this region of Eden. So what we would understand it then to be is if some kind of localized but gigantic inundation of Mesopotamia that wiped out all those people that lived there since creation. Um, yeah. And that's, that's, that's what Noah's seeing when Noah looks out of the ark and he can't see anything but water as far as the eye can see. He, he's describing it in terms of this global disaster, but it isn't really, it isn't global to you know, the entire planet. And the advantage of this position, in my mind, would be that you, you cannot, you don't have to 
reinvent geology, right, Paul? I mean, your position right. basically requires us to go back to geology and go, wow, a lot of this is going to have to be reinterpreted and a lot of this must be mistaken. Uh, you know, local yeah. flood, you don't have to do that, right? You can essentially accept the, the timeline. You can, you, can, you can be an old earth person and still have a real historical flood that is really universal to human beings. Um, and so we don't have to, we can live, we can live with geology and we can live with what the Bible says. It sounds like a win-win, right? Sure. Um, so that's a, that's a real, that's a real advantage. Now, drawbacks to this position, because of course, as I mentioned, this is not my position. I am merely trying to give the best uh, version of it that I can come up with. Um, but the drawbacks, I, I think this is already a poor fit with the way the text describes things. I've already mentioned this notion of repetition. It is not simply a matter of hyperbole, right? If I told you that there was a flood that covered the whole earth, I'm sure, I'm sure that your first response would be, what, the, the whole earth? Because you're immediately thinking he must be speaking hyperbolically. He must be using an exaggeration because that's how we use language. And then I go back and I say, no, no, I mean, the flood covered the whole land. It covered everything. Everything everywhere died. Everything that had the breath of life died. Humans and animals, everything died. All the creeping things, the wild animals, the birds, they all died. You would get the sense that, okay, he's not being hyperbolic. He really means that this covered the planet. So I already think this is not a very good fit to the, to the, um, to the biblical text. Now, archaeologically, um, yeah, the, there are these big river flood deposits, true enough, but I am not aware of any that have been correlated regionally, right? If you think that there is a massive flood such that Noah got in his ark with all of his animals and he could not see anything on the horizon that was land, that's a big flood. That's a geographically extensive flood. Um, and so, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, would, it would have to encompass many different city-states uh, in the Mesopotamian region. And I am unaware of a flood that correlates across that much space, right? So, even though you might point to one city that had a big flood that destroyed it, I'm not sure that you can point to a lot of places in the region. And I think this is a really interesting topic, and I'm, we're already making notes for another episode because I think the whole notion of Mesopotamian floods is really interesting, and we should look yeah. into that. Um, and then I just find the geography to be somewhat questionable. And this is another one of those points where you might say, well, maybe the local flood happened in some other geographic region. Okay, that's, that could be fair. You could weasel out of it that way, or wiggle out of it that way. Let's not be mean. Um, but uh, at the same time, yeah, the, the, the geography of Eden is so odd. There's a river that flows out of Eden that separates into four different rivers, and two of the rivers are the Tigris and the Euphrates. And that's not what happens. <laughs> and frankly, geographically, we don't really have any place like that in the modern world. Rivers don't divide. They, they, they join. They join together as the drainage begins to reach the sea. They, the more and more streams and more and more branches of the river join up into one big channel that then empties into the ocean. This is speaking of something that's really quite different. So I don't, you know, they're using the names, sure, but I don't, it doesn't really match the geography. So, okay, so that's my... That's my reaction to this. Uh, that's my best case. And that's, the, that's, to me, the conundrum of the flood, right? Where are we going to find, yeah. if we really believe that the flood really happened, where are we going to find this physical evidence that it left behind? And the creationist says, it's, it's, it's everywhere. You missed it because you're looking too small. You need to look bigger. Yeah. And the, the local flood guy says, nah, we don't need to do that much disruption to science, and we can just we can just see that the Bible is speaking hyperbolically and it's just the local area. Now, so let's talk about Gavin Ortland. 
And again, um, we're falling all over ourselves here, but we're not, this is not a shot across the bow. We're not trying to attack anybody. We're not trying to question his Christian faith or his orthodoxy or his commitment to evangelical uh, faith or anything like that. We're just going to examine the things he thinks or the, th- the proposals that he put forward about this local flood. So yeah. why don't you start us off, Paul? Yeah, so let's think about some of the points that that Gavin sort of makes in his videos. And the first one uh, that he wants to emphasize is that a local flood doesn't mean a small flood. Um, Mm -hmm. So he's trying to emphasize, you know, that, that, and I guess this is to sort of um, mollify people who think that a local flood can't be right the big flood that's described in the Bible. So he's saying, no, no, local doesn't have to mean small. It can mean unprecedentedly large, but still not covering the the whole earth. Um, And I think there are some problems with that. One is, uh, as you've already said, that if it was not small, if it was a large flood, um, but it was contained within the confines of the lower Mesopotamian basin, then there's essentially no evidence for it. Um, We do have, as you've mentioned so these local flood layers in various cities um as far as i'm aware um they don't all correlate with one another they they are of different ages they're they're small individual events they're not evidence of one single sort of very large event in that area and although gavin is um he, he he's somewhat sort of um equivocal about exactly what he thinks you know the event was that gave rise to the the biblical flood story he does talk about the black sea flood you know that's another sort of uh you know scenario that people have put forward i think there are some problems with that as well um not least that um the black sea basin kind of filled with fresh water actually rather too slowly yes um it would have been it would have been easy to escape from the black sea flood at a reasonable walking pace yes <laughs> and in fact we know that we know that many people were not killed by the black sea flood they were merely displaced uh from where they were living yep and of course the other thing about the black sea flood is that it doesn't actually recede because the black sea is still there so we don't actually have a kind of recession event so yeah um so i think there's some problems with the black sea flood so sure you can um you can say that local doesn't mean small the problem is make it, giving that some kind of application to the regional archaeology and trying to sort of make that make sense um you can't have a devastating widespread but local flood that doesn't leave physical evidence i mean that is just a contradiction in terms so yeah. so that's a problem um Todd, what about this um, claim that even a local flood can be anthropologically universal? In other words, it can affect all of all of humans, all all of humanity. Yeah. Uh, I know you've done a lot of work, sort of look at thinking about this question. So, is that true? I'm I'm really hostile to that claim. <laughs> <laughs> um. But it depends on some things, and so I want to mm. be fair about this. So one of the things that it depends on is the timeline, right? So if if you're advocating the local flood just on a lark and you don't really care about chronology, this is going to be less compelling. But if you're advocating the local flood because you think that's going to help us uh, make peace with geology... Uh, this is where I have a problem because you're basically going to say, okay, there was a flood sometime uh, early in human history when all humans lived in somewhere in the Near Eastern region, right? Middle East. Um, And that that flood wiped out every human being in that region. That's That's a very common claim of these local flood models. And I don't think that works for a number of reasons. And the biggest reason I have against that is that we have Homo sapiens um, already distributed on multiple continents. Um, By the time you reach 
the point in uh, history when, say, Mesopotamia becomes a hub of human settlement and activity. Um, so, for example, we have, uh, and some of these are going to be somewhat disputed, but we have um, Qasem Cave in Israel, which is said to contain human remains from 400 to 200,000 years ago. We have Jebel Arud from Morocco, which is on Africa. That's 300,000 years ago. Uh, Apodema Cave in Greece, which is uh, 215,000 years ago. Um, Omokabish in uh, Ethiopia, which is 200,000 years ago. Herto in Ethiopia, which is 150,000 years ago. Kafsa and School, both in Israel, 80 to 120,000 years ago, and so forth. And what we think of as the Neolithic uh, Revolution in Mesopotamia, that's about 10,000 years ago. So you can see we have evidence of Homo sapiens in places other than Mesopotamia well before this notion of the global flood happens. And it's three continents. We have them in Africa and Ethiopia and Morocco. We have them in Europe and Greece. We have them in, in uh, Asia, in Israel, and so forth. So that becomes a problem to me. Now, the classic answer, of course, would be to dispute whether those are really uh, human remains. But I just find that rather unsatisfactory because it strikes me that the disputation is merely motivated by the desire to discount the evidence of global human <laughs> settlement before yeah. you can have a flood to flood them all in the Middle East. Um, so, and that also runs up against, you know, the genetic evidence as well, which would suggest that humans, uh, yeah, have a very different history than you know, being created in Mesopotamia and spreading out from that one region and then getting hit by a giant flood and then recovering. Um, and that's all, again, this is all assuming a conventional mindset. It is not, I am not here claiming that those fossils are really that old or that these things, uh, yeah, in a creationist mindset, we're going to reinterpret those as post-flood. Um, things and it's not going to be the same. But if I enter into the local flood mindset, I see that it already has problems of consistency within it, right? You've mentioned one that yeah. there really doesn't seem to be a clear layer that is the flood anywhere that we can find in that region of the Middle East. And here we have an a, a example where I don't know how you kill all human beings at the time frame that is most likely to be able to do that, unless you want to stretch, you know, push the flood way back to like, you know, a million years ago or something. But there is a much bigger problem, I think, and that is that the animals. So we might quibble and argue and dispute about whether there are human beings all isolated in the Middle East or whether they've already globally distributed. But you definitely have animals. Um, that are globally dis that are globally distributed, and so you cannot kill all the birds and the creeping things and the wild animals and the beasts of the field. You can't kill them all with a with a local flood because they're everywhere. They're all over the planet, and you might say, "Well, maybe it's referring to the livestock." And but again, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna push back on that because that's not what the text actually says. It deliberately mentions in 721. It talks about the birds and the wild animals and the creeping things and so forth. So it's, it, we're, we've gone from just saying maybe the text is hyperbolic to now, well, maybe the text is using w words that just mean the local animals, even though it says all the animals everywhere that had the breath of life died. And so now we're really beginning to, once again, you're, you're stretching the text of the Bible uh, against a, uh, a, uh, a history, uh, a, the conventional history that just doesn't fit. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. So what's, uh, what's another point that he makes in this video? Yeah. So another point that Gavin wants to emphasize um, is that um, a local flood can still be historical 
And I think he's concerned, you know, that some people just want to say, oh, you're, ju you're just some kind of theological liberal and you don't really think there ever was a flood. Yeah. You know, he wants to emphasize, no, I, I think this, this is real history. Um, you know, and that's fair enough. We, that, 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 yeah. you know, as, a, as an evangelical, you know, that's, we all think that this is, um, you know, this is real history. So, but I think what he's doing there, th this is not a point that is being made in favour of the local flood. It's, it's simply kind of responding to people who might misunderstand what Gavin himself is, you know, he, is trying to claim, you know, what his uh, position is. Um, so it's not really, a, a, you know, an argument for a local flood. And I think in many ways, um, the historicity of the flood counts against a local flood for reasons that we've already talked about. The fact that you can't have a historical flood, which is anthropologically universal. Uh, we, we don't have a historical flood that, that has left an obvious flood layer you know, in the, in the region where we ought to find it. So uh, that makes historicity quite difficult to, to argue, I think. So, so that's, that's one other point that he makes. Now, his next point is one that we've already sort of discussed, which is that the language used in the flood account doesn't have to be understood in a universal sense. It yeah. doesn't have to be understood as global. And as you've already pointed out, it's certainly true that some of the words and phrases and expressions that are used in that text are used elsewhere in Scripture um, in a less than universal sense. They can be used hyperbolically. So we read, for example, that all the earth came to Egypt, you know, at the time of the famine to, yeah. to, to get grain. Or uh, Gavin mentions in 1 Kings 10 verse 24, the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon. You know, we're not... Right. We're not to understand that, you know, people from Britain came to to, to see Solomon and that right, kind of right, right. Um, so so that's that's all fair enough, and I think we we you know concede that that is true. The problem is, I think those examples are not equivalent to what we see in Genesis right. six to nine, because you know if you read through that text again, we've said this before, it's that repeated emphasis, uh, that the repetition the fact of the same truth being stated positively and negatively. You know, it, it's being stated in such a way with such emphasis and repetition that I think isolated verses where the word all or the whole earth is used in a less than universal sense simply are not equivalent to what yeah. we see in the flood account. So, um, so sure, I think we can concede the point that Gavin makes, but actually, I, I don't think it really is relevant to the flood account. Right. So the next two points that he makes are also things that we already, we've already mentioned before, so I'm going to just skim through this really quickly. Uh, talks about the promises um, from after the flood, uh, and he says they could, these could apply universally if, if, uh, the flood was universal with respect to humans. So I will never destroy, I will never kill you all with a flood again. Yes, that, that could still apply and it could still be kept. Um, the tricky bit that I have with that is that the text clearly says that God will destroy, never destroy the ground again. Um, which is not that God will never kill people again. It's that God will never destroy the ground again. And so... If you think the ground does not mean the globe, but just refers to certain amount of land, now you're getting back to the question of, well, how much land is, is necessary to be destroyed by a flood before God has broken his promise? And right. now I feel like a Pharisee quibbling about, you know, <laughs> how, how much should I tithe my, my spices that grow on my windowsill or whatever? Um, yeah, uh, 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 that, that doesn't, that's, that's lawyer argument. I don't want to get into that. I'm not a lawyer. Um, another point he makes that the world in, in second Peter three, uh, that was destroyed by the flood refers to humanity uh, and not to physical geography. Yes. Except that in that passage, the flood is paralleled with creation and the new creation, which are both global events. So it'd be weird if you had a, you know, creation global event, 
local flood and then new creation global event that seems to be in, in order to be theologically consistent across the whole point that you'd want to be, um, yeah, you'd want to be consistent because yeah. otherwise you'd have, you know, a local creation, which is weird, but has been proposed before. We'll link to yes. that in the show notes. John Pye Smith suggested there was a local creation. I don't think yep. anybody really wants to do. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but it's, it seems almost the logical um, outworking yeah. of the local flood idea. If, if, if the flood is the undoing of the creation um, and the flood was only local, then you, you kind of, um, you know, that's, you, you, you're almost bound to sort of infer a local creation event, which is what John Pye Smith, but. Uh, did but of course you know not many people want to go there so for for obvious reasons um yeah so there are some other um points that we we need to think about that sort of came up in gavin's video one concern that he has um and he sort of dwells on this quite a bit is he's concerned that if you if you accept a universal flood then you've got to multiply miracles that go anything beyond what the text actually says um, and he seems quite concerned about that. Um, now, again, uh, this isn't really a kind of positive argument for the local flood view. It's it's more a you know a, a kind of reason to sort of reject the view that we um, would hold. I suppose the problem I have here is that clearly the flood was a miraculous event. I mean, clearly yes. it was a judgment of God, an intervention into, if you like, the natural order. Um, to to cause the flood as a as, as a means of judging the world at that time, and so why would we have to assume that everything about the flood was therefore naturalistic? Um, uh, why would we in effect multiply naturalism <laughs> uh, concerning yeah. the flood? Right. Uh, so I I think the more relevant question would be what's the best explanation of all the evidence, the textual evidence and the physical evidence mm -hmm. taken together. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a better sort of question to ask. So I, I'm not persuaded by, by this. And going beyond the text, well, um, we all go beyond the text because the, the text gives us bare bones details. Yep. Um, and then, you know, we can infer other things from physical evidence. I don't think that's illegitimate um, no. to, to do that. Um, another point that he sort of brings up concerns flood legends, um, and he makes the point that flood legends point to the historicity of the flood, which is certainly true. We'd agree with that. Um, I would say, though, that uh, the flood legends argument works at least as well for the global flood view. In fact, I think it works better yeah. in the global flood view because we don't only have uh, flood traditions in the ancient Near East, which is presumably where you know a local flood would have happened. Um, but we have flood traditions in Asia and Europe and the Americas and even a few in Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, the only way you could really explain those, if if they are truly traditions of a you know memories of a real event, is if the flood was anthropologically universal and as we've already said there's a there are big problems in trying to have an anthropologically universal local flood um that only works i think in a in a worldwide flood context uh and then um one other point he he kind of raises is he he wants to emphasize that believing in a local flood does not put him outside the bounds of orthodoxy. This is an allowable option for faithful Christians. Um, and again, you know, I think we would agree. Um, uh, we can all be wrong about lots of things in the Bible. We, we may think we may think that the local flood view is wrong. I, I don't think either of us are saying that we think that puts Gavin Ortland somehow outside the evangelical camp or outside no. the bounds of orthodoxy. No. Um, all of us, I'm sure, can be wrong about all kinds of things to do with the Bible and theology and and other things, and it doesn't make us sort of somehow less less Christian. Um, you right. know, we we are still Christians, even if we sometimes get things wrong. So, yeah. um, so that's all that we're saying. We we disagree with him on the local flood, but we don't want to sort of unchristian him. Um, 
Yeah, you I know. think I think that's a super important point because we're human beings. We have a very limited yeah. view, and every one of us is wrong about a lot of our theology. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, all of you theologians out there, but it is necessary that there's you know certain things I agree we we've pretty much settled and, and it's the best fit to the Bible and it's the best fit to logic and rationality. Yes, I'll agree with that. But there's a lot of detail in a lot of theologies that are probably just going to end up being wrong. And God's mercy covers that. It's the beautiful thing about it, um, that we can all yeah. be wrong about things because it's not about passing a theology test in order to get into God's kingdom and into heaven. It is about Jesus' blood. And so it is grace and mercy. It is not based on your grade. <laughs> yeah. A- so. Absolutely. And I and I'm so glad people don't unchristian me because of, you know, things that they disagree with me about. So, right. so absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, so Todd, where do where do we go from here? Having, yeah. Having thought I, about some of these points. You know, the the conundrum here, it what it leaves us with is a situation of discomfort, I think, for everybody. Um so on the young age creation side, which is my side, I find great comfort and excitement in exploring geology from the perspective of trying to understand how the flood interacts with the, the geological record. Uh, I think that's pretty exciting. But I understand that some people are going to find that to be a very uncomfortable position to have that would produce a lot of anxiety. Um, how can I watch National Geographic? I have, I have to reject everything they say. And I think you don't have to reject everything they say, but okay. Uh, I get it. You, you have anxiety about that. Um, but the, the, the issue I have with the local flood model that is, and this is, again, I'm not talking necessarily to Gavin, but it's across the board is what I've observed. There tends to be this sense that the local flood alleviates the tension of the conundrum, that if you accept the local flood, then you can accept the old earth, you can accept the, the conventional timeline, and you can still have a, an actual historical massive catastrophe just as the Bible describes. You can have it all. And I don't think it does that. And that's, that's my beef with it. It does not do what it advertises. <laughs> it doesn't live up to the hype. Um, so you, you end up with... I think a, a rather uncomfortable fit with the text. I don't think it's as easy as just saying these words are used hyperbolically. I think there's more to the, the globalness of the flood than just that. I think that the idea that this just fits right in with geology and archaeology, maybe, probably not, you still have to address these these questions of science and anthropology and paleoanthropology and um, archaeology and where is the flood and what what is it that you think actually you know in the in the ancient near east wherever wherever it is where where is this flood and yeah so i i guess on our side <laughs> we also have people who are very loud about how you know, the global flood explains it all and there's no evidence for anybody else's position. I find all of those kinds of claims to be unsatisfactory. The conundrum of the flood yeah. exists. It's real. That's why we keep training up young creation geologists to keep exploring these things. Um, now, I suppose you could argue that we should just be, you know, agnostic about, you know, the local flood person might just say, well, maybe we haven't found the, the layer that is the flood yet. Or maybe we, we haven't, you know, we, we have good reasons to think those human remains from three different continents before the time of the Neolithic Revolution, those aren't really human after all, or some other thing. And, I'm, and, and I feel like, yeah, sure, but you're getting to the point of just hand-waving at that point. You're not actually providing a good explanation for data. You're providing a good. You're you're trying to provide an explanation for why there is no data, um, and I I don't that doesn't I don't I don't like that. I I would rather us 
just get out there and dig in and and resolve these questions. Now, again, emphasizing here, this is not a matter of heresy. This doesn't put anybody outside the church or outside the reach of God's grace or any nonsense like that. Um, but yeah, I think I think it should I think it should spur us on to go deeper into these questions, which is why, as I already mentioned, I'm kind of making notes for a for a follow up episode here where we're going to look at. <laughs> Mesopotamian floods, because there's, yeah, there turns out there's a massive literature on this already out there. People have got all sorts of great scientific papers that have been looking at these things. And I think that's pretty cool. But in, but as far as I can tell already, the, the local flood view just doesn't do what it says. And I don't think it's a very good fit to scripture. It doesn't do what it says scientifically, and it's not a very good fit to scripture. And so I'm, I'm not a fan. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't do what it says on the tin. Yeah. And um, yeah. And uh, I, th- I think that's basically the conclusion that we've both come to. Now, as we said at the outset, you know, we appreciate Gavin's cordiality um, in dealing with, you know, these issues of disagreement. And I don't know, I'm speaking for myself here. I don't know about you, Todd, but I would love to have a good natured conversation with Gavin about the- these kinds of questions. I-, I I'm pretty sure he doesn't watch our podcast but if he does if if he does get to hear this podcast if he does get to see it um then we would love to sort of uh yeah to do that to make that conversation happen um and so yeah reach out to us that that would be fantastic okay uh that's been fun i i think the local flood as you said at the outset is a really interesting topic in and of its own right so um, I, I will come back to it. And uh, yeah, the, the Mesopotamian flood idea and the Black Sea flood, you know, all of those are really interesting topics. And uh, we, we, we'll come back to those in future episodes. But for now, that's it. Um, uh, we will see you uh, next time in a couple of weeks. And we hope you'll join us then. See you later. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.